right, everyone get ready because we are going deep today, deep into C++ machine learning. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. We're ditching Python. We're going hardcore. Hardcore from scratch. From scratch. No shortcuts. And uh, we're going to be looking at this really cool YouTube series. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. By this guy, Gerard Taylor. He's amazing. Uh, he's great. He's really, he really knows his stuff. He does. And, you know, so he starts off with the MNAP. The MNAP challenge. Challenge. Yeah. And, you know, that's kind of like the Hello World. Yeah. Yeah. It's a classic. It's a classic. And so we're going to be looking at how he does that. But mm -hmm. before we jump into all of that, mm -hmm. I'm curious, like, C++ A. Like, why C++ A? Isn't that kind of... Well, you know, a lot of people think of C++ as this. Um, like old school. Yeah, old school language. You right. know, people think of it like you're working on like... Um, like embedded systems. Yeah, embedded systems or like, you know, high performance computing. Right, right. But, you know, it's actually still really relevant today. Okay, so why? Why is it relevant for machine learning? Well, I think the biggest reason is is performance. You know, okay. C++ is known for its speed. Oh, okay. Right? And that's, like, super important when you're dealing with... Big data. Massive data sets, and you've got these complex calculations that you got to, you know, you got to yeah. crunch. Yeah. C++ can handle that, like, really efficiently. So it's like a... It's like a race car. It's like a race car, yeah. Rather than, like, a minivan. Exactly. Exactly. Right. If you need to get somewhere fast... C++ is your vehicle. I like it. I like it. And what about, you know, what about like the control? Ah, uh, yes, control. Another big advantage of C++ mine. You know, when you're working with Python, you're often relying on these these high-level libraries. Mm -hmm. But with C++ mine, you get down to the nitty-gritty. You get nuts and bolts. Nuts and bolts. You have control over things like memory management, right. how your data is stored and accessed. That's got to be important for performance, too. It's crucial especially when you're trying to optimize your code for speed and efficiency. Yeah. You know, every little bit counts. Yeah, I bet. Okay, so we've got the performance aspect, the yeah. control aspect, but what about actually understanding the algorithms? That's another great point. Does does building them from scratch in C++ Go, does that really make a difference? Oh, absolutely. You know, when you're using a framework, it's easy to treat those algorithms like magic boxes. Yeah. You know, you put data in, you get results out, but you don't really understand what's happening under the hood. Right, right. But when you build it yourself yeah. from scratch, you have to grapple with every detail. You have to think about how the algorithm works step by step. Right. And that leads to a much deeper understanding. So it's like it's like you're not just driving the car, you're actually building the engine. Exactly. Okay. So let's let's get specific then. Okay. What does he actually what does Gerard actually build in this series? Well, he focuses on creating two key components. The data container and the data handler. Data container, data handler. And these are these are like the building blocks for everything else he's going to do. So the data container, this is basically a way to store and organize the MS data. Okay, so that's all the all the images of the All the handwritten digits, yep. Okay. And their corresponding labels. You know, like is this a zero, is this a one, and so on. And you know, it, it always seems a bit mysterious to me why it's a binary file format. Like why not just use a plain text file? Well, you know, binary files are actually much more efficient for storing large amounts of data. Like, you know, we're talking about tens of thousands of images here. Nice. And binary files are, they're compact, they take up less space, and they can handle different types of data more easily. You know, you've got images, you've got labels, you got to pack it all together nicely. Right, right. So that's where the binary format comes in. So it's a space saver. Exactly. And then you have the data handler, which is like the... A brain. The brain, the organizer. It's like the librarian for the MAS data. I like it. The librarian. Yeah. So it reads in that raw binary data. Okay. And then it splits it up into different sets. You've got your training set, your testing set, and your validation set. Why is that important? Uh, well, you know, you don't want to train your algorithm on the same data that you use to test it. Right. Right. That's like giving students the answers to the exam beforehand. Uh-huh. Yeah. You want to make sure your algorithm can generalize to new data. Yeah. You want to see how it performs in the real world. Exactly. Yeah. So the data handler does all this splitting, and it makes sure everything's organized and labeled correctly. It's a very meticulous librarian. A very meticulous librarian. And it's doing all of this in C++ code, like yeah. with pointers and all that stuff. Yes, yes. You know, Gerard is really smart about how he uses C++ features to make the code efficient. 
He uses pointers and references to avoid unnecessary copying of data. Right. You know, those images are big. Yeah. You don't want to be copying them around all the time. It's like moving an entire library. Exactly. So pointers are like, you know, they're like little arrows pointing to the actual data. You can pass them around quickly and easily without moving the data itself. Oh, okay. So it's like it's like sharing a map to the library instead of moving all the books. Precisely. And, you know, there's another interesting detail here about the MNASIC data. Okay. It comes in a specific binary format, and there's a chance of running into something called an endianness issue. Endianness. What is that? So basically, different computer architectures store data in memory in different ways. Okay. Some store the most significant byte first, and some store the least significant byte first. Oh, I see. And if the MNES data is stored in a different endianness than your computer expects, well, things can get messed up. It's like trying to read a book where the pages are bound in reverse order. Exactly. But don't worry, Gerard has got us covered. He does. He's included a function in his code that converts the data to the correct endianness for your machine. Oh, okay, so he's like, he's thought ahead. He's anticipated the potential roadblock. He's like a C++ superhero. You could say that. He's making sure that our journey into C++ machine learning is smooth and efficient. I love it. So we've got our efficient data handler. We've got our neatly organized data container. We've even tackled this Indianness issue. Yeah. It sounds like we're all set to start building some actual machine learning algorithms. We are, and it's going to be exciting. I can't wait. Let's dive into those algorithms. Let's do it. After a quick break, of course, stay tuned. We'll be right back. So, are you ready to get into some algorithms? I am, yeah. Let's talk algorithms. All right. So, first up, we have K-nearest neighbors. K-nearest neighbor. Or K-N-N for short. K-N-N. Oh. And this one, this one's really cool because it's actually pretty simple. Okay. That's good. Yeah. Straightforward is good when we're talking about doing this stuff from scratch. Absolutely. So imagine, you know, you've got your scatter plot, right? Oh. With all those MDNX images. Yep. And you get a new image and you want to classify it. You want to figure out, you know, what digit is this? Right, right. So what KNN does is it looks at the K data points that are closest to it. The K closest, okay. Yeah. In terms of like the pixel value. Exactly. The yeah. pixel values, you know, how similar they look. Uh, and basically it's like, you know, asking your neighbors, hey, what does this look like to you? Okay. And then it does a majority vote. A majority vote. Yeah. It looks at the labels of those K nearest neighbors. Okay. And it picks the label that appears most often. Oh, interesting. So if, you know, if most of its neighbors are saying, hey, this looks like a seven. Right. Then it's going to predict that the new image is also a seven. Okay. So it's like, it's literally like it's looking at its neighbors. It is. It is. It's all about finding those closest data points. So how do you, how do you choose the right value for K? Like... How many neighbors should it be looking at? Uh, yeah, that's that's a good question. You know, K is a parameter that we can adjust. Right. And it's kind of like a Goldilocks situation. Yeah. You know, you don't want it to be too small. You don't want it to be too big. Right. So if K is too small, the algorithm might be too sensitive to outliers or noise in the data. It's like if you only asked one neighbor for their opinion. Yeah. And they happen to be, you know. A little strange. A little strange. Oh. Yeah. But then if K is too large, you might over smooth your predictions okay. and you might miss subtle patterns. So you got to find that sweet spot. You got to find that sweet spot. Does Gerard, is, does he address that in his code? He does. Yeah. He actually experiments with different values of K. Okay. And he tests the accuracy of the algorithm to see, you know, what works best. Okay. So it's like trying on different shoes to find the right fit. Exactly. Exactly. You know, you got to find the one that performs the best. Now, you mentioned uh, k-means clustering. Ah, yes, k-means. And and that sounds a bit different. It is a bit different. This is this is where we get into unsupervised learning. Unsupervised learning, okay. Which means we don't have labels for our data points. Right. So we're not trying to predict a label. Instead, we're trying to group similar images together. Based on their, like, their features. Based on their features, exactly. So it's kind of like, you know, imagine you have a big pile of socks. A big pile of socks. Okay. All jumbled up. Okay, yeah. yeah. And you want to sort them into pairs, but you don't know which sock belongs to which pair. Right. You're just looking for socks that look similar. Okay. That's what K-means is doing. All right. So how does it how does it do that? So the K in K means refers to the number of clusters that we want to create. 
Okay. So, you know, we might decide we want to create 10 clusters. Right. One for each digit. Okay. And the algorithm starts by randomly choosing K data points to be the initial centers of these clusters. So, like, we're just picking 10 random MList images. Exactly. Just as a starting point. Okay. And then it goes through each remaining image. Right. And it assigns it to the cluster whose center is closest. Okay. In terms of the pixel values again. In terms of the pixel values, yeah. Like, How similar they look. Got it. And then here's the cool part. It recalculates the cluster centers okay. by averaging the positions of all the images within each cluster. So the centers of the clusters, they're like, they're moving. They're moving, yeah. As the algorithm learns. As the algorithm learns. Oh, that's interesting. And this process repeats okay. until the clusters settle down, you know. Right. They don't change much anymore. So it's figuring out. It's figuring out how to group the images how to group the images even though we didn't give it any labels that's pretty amazing it is it is it's finding hidden patterns in the data so like real world like where we'd use this oh man there's there's so many applications for clustering okay you know you could use it to group customers with similar buying habits okay yeah you could identify different types of cells in a biological sample mm -hmm. you could analyze patterns in social media data anywhere where you're trying to find meaningful groupings okay so it's like it's finding the patterns that we like can't even see exactly exactly and you know we've talked about k nearest neighbors we've talked about k means clustering mm -hmm. but gerard he doesn't stop there he actually builds a neural network from scratch in C++ Sci. Oh wow. Okay, that's that's a whole other level. Neural networks, those are those are complex. They are. They are. They're inspired by the structure of the human brain. Right. And they're known for their ability to learn like incredibly complex patterns. Yeah, I've always found them a bit mysterious. Like, can you can you break them down for me a little bit? Yeah, sure. So a neural network is basically made up of these interconnected nodes okay. called neurons. Neurons, okay. And they're organized into layers. Layers. So each neuron receives input from other neurons. Uh -huh. There's a little calculation. Right. And then passes its output to other neurons. So like a chain reaction. Yeah, like a chain reaction of calculation. Happening across this network. And the connections between these neurons, they have weights associated with them. Weights? Yeah, and those weights determine how strong the signal is that passes through. Okay. So training a neural network is all about adjusting those weights. Right. So that the network learns to accurately map inputs to outputs. So it's like fine-tuning a massive system of knobs and dials. Exactly. Exactly. It's like you're trying to get all those signals flowing in just the right way. To get the right output. To get the right output. Yeah. Okay. So, but but how, how do you actually train it? Ah, well... There's this really clever technique called backpropagation. Backpropagation. Yeah, and it's basically an algorithm that allows us to figure out okay. how much each weight contributes to the error of the network. The error. Yeah, so, you know, the network makes predictions. Right. And those predictions might be wrong. Okay, so it's making mistakes. It's making mistakes. And then it's learning from those mistakes. Yeah. Exactly. And backpropagation helps us figure out how to adjust the weights to minimize those errors. So it's like it's like a feedback loop. It is. It is. It's like a feedback loop that guides the learning process. So by repeatedly feeding the network data okay. and adjusting the weights based on the errors, right. we can train it to do some pretty amazing things. Right. So image recognition. Image recognition, translating languages, even composing music. Wow. Neural networks are pretty powerful. That's mind-blowing. Yeah. Uh. But building one from scratch in C++ T, why, why not just use TensorFlow? Yeah, you know, it's definitely more challenging to do it from scratch. Right. But there's a huge benefit to understanding how they work under the hood. You know, right. it's like the difference between knowing how to drive a car right. and understanding the engineering principles behind its design. So it's a deeper understanding. It's a deeper understanding. And, you know, while frameworks are great tools, there's always going to be a need for those who can build from scratch. So, yeah, frameworks are like, they're like the power tools. They are. They are. They make things faster and easier. But you got to know how to use them. But you got to know how to use them. And sometimes, you know, you need to get your hands dirty and build something custom. This has been a fantastic. I mean, we've covered so much ground. Yeah. Key nearest neighbors. Key means clustering neural networks. I'm feeling a lot more confident about C++ machine learning. What what else can we learn from from looking at Gerard's implementation? Welcome back. And, you know, we've talked about pointers and references before. Yeah. 
Like, how do those actually play into, like, the efficiency of his code? Uh, those are, those are, like, essential C++ K. Right. Like, you know, they can really make a difference when you're, when you're working with large data sets. Right. Yeah. Like, M assessed, like, C++ is all about control, right? Mm. Memory management. Right. And that can be scary. It can be. It can be scary. You know, you can easily make mistakes. Oh, yeah. You know, memory leaks, crashes, it's, it's all part of the fun. But. But when you use it right. Uh, but when you use it right, that's when that's when the magic happens. Mm -hmm. So, you know, pointers. Pointers are like, you know, they're like addresses. Okay. Right. So instead of copying this this huge chunk of data, mm. you just pass around these little pointers. Oh, okay. Tiny little things. So it's like instead of instead of carrying around like a like a whole treasure chest. Yeah. You're just carrying around a map to the treasure chest. Exactly. Exactly. It's way more efficient. Okay. And references references are kind of similar. They're like um, they're like aliases. Yeah. You know, like a nickname for a variable. Okay. So it's like you know instead of instead of calling me you know my full name you can just I mean, call me you know. Exactly. But it's the same person. Same person, oh, but it's just, it's more efficient. Okay. Less typing. Right, right. And he's using these all over the place, and he's building these algorithms from scratch. Oh, yeah. Like, without these libraries. Yeah. Like, what does that, what does that even mean? Like, what? why is that important? I mean, frameworks are great, you know? Like, TensorFlow, PyTorch. Sure. They make things easier. They're, they're powerful tools. Right. But there's something to be said about about knowing how to build it yourself. Right. You know, it's like it's like the difference between between driving a car okay. and knowing how to how to build the engine. Right, and fix it. Exactly. Yeah. If it breaks down. If it breaks down, yeah. you know, you're not just stuck. Right. Right. Yeah. So it's like it's like that deeper understanding. It is. It is. And it can be really valuable if you want to push the boundaries, you know? Yeah. Optimize for specific hardware. Right. Maybe even come up with your own new algorithms. So it's like it's like you're a mechanic. You're a mechanic. And you can fine tune the engine? You can fine tune the engine. You know how it all works. Yeah. You can make it sing. That's awesome. Yeah. I'm really glad we did this. This has been a great yeah, journey. It has. Into C++ machine learning. We've covered so much. I'm feeling like I could actually maybe tackle some of this myself. I think you can. I think you can. Everyone out there, I mean, if, if you're interested in this, I highly recommend checking out Gerard's tutorial series. Yeah, he's a great teacher. It's really good. It's really inspiring. And, you know, this is just the beginning. Oh, yeah. I mean, machine learning is huge. It's a vast and ever-expanding field. There's always something new to learn, new problems to solve, yeah. new algorithms to discover. So keep learning, keep questioning. And keep creating. That's it for our deep dive today. We'll yeah. see you next time.